How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. listening or watching DNA Today. We are a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Dineen. I'm a prenatal genetic counselor. And on this show, we explore genetics and the impact on our health with conversations of leaders in the field. My guest today is Dr. Shara Alwyn, who is the co-director of Terrace, the Tratogen Information System, which is a clinical resource that assesses teragenic risks of pregnancy exposures on the fetus. A little bit about Dr. Alwyn. She is a birth defects epidemiologist and teratologist who holds professional positions at the University of Washington and the University of British Columbia. Do you or someone you know have Prader-Willi syndrome? Harmony Bioscience is looking for people with Prader-Willi syndrome to enroll in a new clinical study in the United States. Harmony Biosciences will be studying the safety and impact of an investigational medicine on excessive daytime sleepiness, cognition, and behavioral function in people with Prader-Willi syndrome. Use the link in the show notes to learn more about the clinical study and refer a patient to a study center. The link is also available at dnapodcast.com. Picture Genetics is a unique DNA testing service with tests designed for every stage of life, including family planning. With a picture parenting carrier test, you can uncover genetic conditions that may be passed on to your kids, such as cystic fibrosis or fragile X syndrome. Unlike other companies, this is actually a clinical grade test where physicians and genetic counselors are involved. It's easy to order and understand with good looking reports. To order your picture genetics test, go to picturegenetics.com and use code DNA today for 25% off and free shipping. Get actionable genetic insights today to benefit your family of tomorrow. Thank you so much, Dr. Alwyn, for joining me on the show today. My pleasure. So I thought we could start out with some background information on birth defects for those that, you know, maybe have heard of birth defects, but don't understand their causes, possibly preventions from that. Could you provide our listeners with a little bit of background on this? Absolutely. So um, birth defects, um, what we commonly refer to as congenital congenital anomalies, um, can be structural uh, or functional abnormalities that occur during intrauterine life. Um, Structural birth defects uh, or malformations are seen in about 1 in 33 infants within the first year of life and are considered the second most common cause of infant mortality after prematurity. Uh, So they account for up to 25% of all uh, perinatal deaths. The frequency of structural birth defects is higher, usually in spontaneous abortions or miscarriages, than in life-born infants, reflecting that many of the most severe conditions are incompatible with survival. Functional uh, uh, congenital anomalies or birth defects like intellectual disability are infrequently recognized in infancy, but are at least as common as malformations among older children and adults. In terms of causes, um, genetic factors, including chromosomal abnormalities and single gene conditions probably cause about half of all recognized birth defects, while environmental factors account for up to 5%. Um, And there's also the combination of both multiple genetic um, and environmental factors, what we call multifactorial causes, um, that are thought to produce the remaining. And um, with regard to prevention, um, while understanding the potential causes of a child born with a birth defect, whether it's genetic, uh, multifactorial, uh, a teratogenic exposure that has been identified, would lead to more appropriate management and counseling for future pregnancies and would provide the families with an opportunity to make future productive decisions that are better for them. Of course, primary prevention uh, um, uh, of, uh, of would be the, would el- eliminate tremendous um, suffering and costs. So um, with that, I mean, including optimizing uh, women's health before conception by um, uh, screening and treating illnesses, um, avoiding cigarette smoking, or abuse of alcohol uh, or other recreational drugs and achieving a healthy body weight uh, by getting sufficient exercise and a healthy diet and taking folic acid uh, prior to conception uh, along with other essential vitamins. And teratogens can have a role in the development of birth defects. What are some of the more common teratogenic exposures? I mean, you mentioned a couple of them in terms of like cigarettes, 
um, you know, alcohol exposure, different medications. Are there any others to throw into the mix? Um, yeah. So let me begin by um, by defining teratogen, because sometimes that is probably um, a term that is not um, it's not very common to hear. I agree with that. Um, yeah. So um, generally, the term teratogen has been used to denote an agent that can cause um, abnormalities of form, function, or both in an exposed embryo or fetus. And this could be a little misleading um, because it denotes that any agent is either a teratogen or not a teratogen. So we always uh, commonly think of a list of human teratogens um, uh, that we want to avoid and a list of safe uh, medications or exposures that are okay to take to be um, to be exposed to in pregnancy. In reality, teratogenicity is actually a property of, of an exposure, which doesn't only include the physical or chemical uh, property of the agent, but also the dose, the route, um, uh, gestational timing involved, and there are also other factors that would determine whether an exposure can cause developmental damage, such as um, other uh, concurrent exposures or genetic susceptibility of the mother and the embryo or the fetus to, to this particular exposure. Um, so um, you asked me if teratogenic agents, um, uh, what, 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 what kind of teratogenic exposures um, um, we know. So um, I, wanna, I wanna move on to say more like the uh, teratogenic exposures can be grouped into four major categories on the basis of the kind of uh, agent involved. Um, we could have infectious agents um, uh, such as viral infections like um, uh, rubella and Zika, for example, um, or parasites like toxoplasmosis. Um, they could be physical agents like uh, ionizing radiation, x-rays, for example, or heat. So possible sources of fetal hypo hyperthermia include high maternal fever during the very early stages of pregnancy um, that may predispose to the development of neural tube defects for example. And another type of teratogenic uh, agents are the drug and chemical agents, and those include environmental agents like organic mercury compounds, for example, food that is heavily contaminated with methylmercury um, can affect um, the normal development of the central nervous system and is considered a teratogenic exposure. Lead also is another example. Uh, recreational substances such as um, uh, alcohol and tobacco use and uh, those ones stand out because they are considered important public health problems in our society and for both adults and the developing embryo or fetus. Um, also, prescription drugs, um, examples of those include uh, um, thalidomide, um, some, uh, it's a known example, uh, and then some anticonvulsant drugs um, like valproic acid, um, retinoic acid, which is, uh, has been treated for acne. These are all considered to be pretty teratogenic. And the fourth type of teratogenic exposures are what we call maternal metabolic factors, like inadequate intake of folic acid, um, obesity, or uh, being diabetic. Um, di so diabetes mellitus is actually considered the principal maternal uh, metabolic disorder that raises concern for the developing fetus. And focusing in on some of the medications that pregnant people are taking, I mean, it's estimated 90% of pregnant people are taking some medication at some point during their pregnancy. So that's most people. Mm -hmm. What are some of those common medications that it's okay to take during pregnancy? Okay, so um, it's important to know that medications in general are not tested for safety in human pregnancy before they are approved for marketing. Um, because of ethical reasons for that. But um, the passive adverse event reporting schemes that required after their approval have proven to be inefficient means of identifying drug treatments that may cause uh, birth defects. So one of the most difficult aspects of counseling pregnant women about teratogenic risks associated with various exposures during pregnancy is the fact that there are very few exposures for which the available uh, information is sufficient to estimate the magnitude and the severity of the risk with any confidence. And when we talk about medications, available data are pretty insufficient to determine the teratogenic risk associated with medications that um, pregnant women uh, may be treated with. So I think it's important for healthcare professionals to admit um, the limitation of their knowledge to, the, to themselves and to their patients as well. And the risk should be provided as an estimate 
um, and couched in appropriate uncertainty as well. This may be inconvenient, but it is also better than assuming that the lack of information means the lack of risk or vice versa. Yeah, I think that's really important just to share with patients. This is the research that we have. So far, Mm -hmm. we haven't seen any adverse reactions or development birth defects in a developing fetus when taken during pregnancy, but research is never foolproof. So certainly that's an aspect to be highlighting to patients of, okay, this is all the information. Um, Yeah. You know, thinking about certain prescriptions, antidepressants are very common. So Lexapro, Zoloft, Prozac, just to name a few, these are more heavily studied compared to other medications that we've been talking about. The recommendation for pregnant people that are on these medications prior to getting pregnant and maybe just found out they're, mm-hmm. whatever, six weeks pregnant, they're like, okay, I just discovered this. Do I continue my antidepressant? Um, what's the, the general advice or conversation surrounding that? Yeah, that's a great question because um, the examples of antidepressant drugs that you mentioned as well um, all uh, belong to a class of drugs called uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs for short. And these medications are the most commonly used antidepressants nowadays among women of reproductive age. Um, They're probably the most commonly used prescription medications in general. (laughs) Yes, I think so. Yeah. So um, because of that, there's been an extensive amount of studies assessing the teratogenic risk of these medications in pregnancy. And although there have been a small number of studies that have shown the risk of birth defects, um, specifically heart defects, to be slightly increased, uh, over the background risk, uh, background population risk of uh, three to five percent, the majority of the studies did not detect that increased risk um, in terms of taking. So, uh, for, for for most for most of the SSRIs, but in terms of taking those drugs later in the second um, or third trimester of pregnancy, it appears to contribute to uh, some pregnancy complications such as low birth weight or preterm delivery. Um, some withdrawal symptoms uh, when taken uh, late in pregnancy, uh, if, uh, neonatal withdrawal synd- symptoms. Um, but um, research um, has also shown that untreated anxiety or depression um, could also increase the chance of such pregnancy complications. So it's very difficult for most of, in most of these studies um, to determine whether those risks are actually uh, attributable to the medication or to the underlying condition or to other factors that are common between the both. So it's important to focus more on assessing the individual needs for each pregnant woman battling depression by providing comprehensive counseling and support with all treatment options discussed on a case-by-case basis. Yeah, I think that's really important just to look at, okay, there could be some risks being on a medication, but on the flip side, there also could be risks of not taking that medication. I think you highlighted a really important aspect that a lot of pregnant people may not be realizing of, oh, there's risks if I'm not on this medication. And anxiety and depression during pregnancy can have an effect as well. Um, so really looking at the person yeah. um, and you know the individual and, and coming at it from more of that holistic angle. Another question that I get from patients probably every day now that we're in this pandemic is, what do we know about COVID-19 and pregnancy? Have there been any findings on effects to a fetus if a pregnant person contracts COVID-19? And then along with that is vaccinations. Should pregnant people be vaccinated? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, information on um, COVID-19 is rapidly evolving, but in terms of early pregnancy exposure, There's not enough data yet for us to determine any teratogenic risk with confidence. But available studies so far do not suggest an increased risk of either miscarriage or birth defects. Um, It's important to note, however, that, you know, fever uh, is a symptom of uh, COVID-19. And as I mentioned earlier, that elevated maternal temperatures in early pregnancy could interfere with central nervous system development. In terms of exposure throughout pregnancy in general and the risk of other pregnancy complications, it seems that infection with COVID-19 in pregnancy increases the chance for preterm delivery. This has been shown in plenty of studies, big studies. And some studies have also shown increased risk for preeclampsia, which um, means uh, severe pregnancy hypertension or high blood pressure, um, and low birth weight, uh, and also um, the majority of them Uh, affected pregnant women who uh, 
um, get infected with COVID-19 end up having um, delivering C-section. So um, again, this all depends on how severely affected the pregnant patient is and how sick she is um, and, and the timing of exposure of infection. Um, in terms of the COVID-19 vaccines, um, well, they're not like vaccines. And based on what is known about these types of vaccines, getting a COVID vaccine is not expected to increase the chance of birth defects. There, of course, there's no studies um, yet, but um, pregnant women are now uh, who are taking the vaccine are being enrolled in clinical trials, and hopefully they will have more data to be able to um, um, confirm safety of this uh, of taking a medication. Uh, of to, sorry, of taking the vaccine in pregnancy. Yeah, and, and even with the COVID-19 vaccine, it's also looking at it from the other side as if you don't get vaccinated during pregnancy, what is the risk of having you know COVID during pregnancy? And we've seen that, that cases of COVID-19 during pregnancy, those tend to be more the severe cases. Yeah. Um, during pregnancy, the immune system is lower, so that's certainly part of you know, the deciding whether to get vaccinated or not, and certainly talk to healthcare providers and helping to make that um, decision. But right now, I think the big highlight is we've not seen any birth defects related to the vaccine or the virus in general. That's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other exposure I wanted to talk about briefly is marijuana. This is one that a lot of people are using, and there's I think limited information in terms of the effect on a pregnancy. Is is there any concrete data? Is there any recommendations if someone is, obviously we want to say that we want to avoid recreational drugs during pregnancy, but some people are going to regardless. Yeah. Um, is there any advice coming from your standpoint with that? So the, the problem that the effect of marijuana use during pregnancy is very difficult to estimate uh, and or study. Um, marijuana or cannabis um, contains about 400 different chemicals and preparations um, also differ between you know place and place and and can be contaminated with other drugs uh, with pesticides or um, other uh, stuff so although the majority of studies um, do not indicate an increased risk of birth defects among women who took marijuana in early pregnancy those studies are older in nature and um, um, the THC, the main component in, uh, in marijuana, um, uh, that was available, uh, that is available today, is uh, is stronger and it's far more potent um, than before. And also, um, the roots of exposure have changed. So most women used to inhale, and now it's become more edible. And uh, uh, edible marijuana um, might have might lead to higher levels in the body and possibly a higher risk to the fetus. So the general recommendation is treat from marijuana like alcohol and try and avoid during pregnancy as much as possible. It's really not known what the risks could be. Yeah, I think that's that's well said that we need a lot more research on this, but that is the recommendation to avoid. Before ending the show, I want to remind you about Picture Genetics with their exclusive 25% discount for you as a DNA Today listener. Picture Genetics is different from a traditional direct consumer test because it's clinical grade testing with every case reviewed by a healthcare provider. Results are focused on health with medically actionable and useful information for you and your family. I did a couple of their kits, including their picture parenting one. Here's how it worked. I sent off my tube of spit to the lab who sequenced a bunch of genes. This means that they read through each gene to see if there was a mutation or pathogenic variants as we genetic counselors call them. Then a geneticist looked at my results and created a beautifully easy to read report informing me about my carrier results. Here's my favorite part. There's also genetic counseling offered, so you can speak with a genetic counselor about your results. Order your own kit at picturegenetics.com and use code DNA today for 25% off and free shipping. Again, that's picturegenetics.com. Get actionable genetic insights today to benefit your family of tomorrow. Thanks for listening and join us next time to discover new advances in the world of genetics. If you have patients with Prader-Willi syndrome, please let them know about a new clinical study looking for participants across the United States. Harmony Biosciences will be studying the safety and impact of an investigational medicine. The study will focus on excessive daytime sleepiness, cognition, and behavioral function in people with Prader-Willi syndrome. The study participation is four months long and consists of five visits. If you're a patient, at your visits, you will participate in sleep tests and have general check-ins on how you're feeling. You'll also need to keep a sleep diary for the first two weeks and a closing diary once you start treatment. 
If you're a caregiver, you'll attend all visits with the patient and help provide information to the trial researchers. There are 13 trial sites in the United States, and Harmony Biosciences will reimburse patients to travel to their closest site. Refer yourself, a patient, or a loved one to the study by visiting the link in the show notes, which is also available at dnapodcast.com. There's a lot to keep track of during pregnancy for people that are pregnant, looking to get pregnant, but also healthcare providers to track all the new research with all of the teratogens and, okay, what is the recommendation? How dangerous is this? At what point in pregnancy is it dangerous? You're the co-director of Terrace. Could you give us a bit of a background on the database and how this could help healthcare providers stay updated on this? I mean, I'm, I'm included in this list of practicing <laughs> prenatal genetic counseling. Absolutely. So Terrace, um, uh, which stands for the Teratogen Information System, it's an authoritative, uh, dynamic clinical teratology resource uh, located at the University of Washington that provides expert guidance on the teratogenic risk of over 1,700 medications and other exposures, including infections and vaccines. And Terrace was founded in 1984 by Dr. Jan Friedman, who is a, a clinical geneticist and a uh, a clinical teratologist and a professor of medical genetics at the University of British Columbia. Um, so Dr. Friedman co-led uh, the database um, as its principal um, investigator, along with uh, Dr. Janine Polifka, who served as Terrace director until December 2019. And together they wrote and updated the summaries for all this time, um, and Terrace wouldn't have been there without them. Um, and Dr. Friedman continues to hold uh, a key role in Terrace as an advisory board member. So who else is part of the team to create all these summaries for all the different teratogens? I mean, you have over 1,700. That's, that's a huge database. I mean, that's like, you know, you think about the most common medications, that's usually like 100, 200, but you go way beyond that. Yeah, that's right. Um, so um, we have, um, um, as of January 2020, Terrace, um, um, agent summaries are written and updated by myself and my coworker, uh, Dr. Kimberly Grant, um, who co-directs uh, Terrace with me. Uh, Dr. Grant is a developmental uh, neurotoxicologist in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences um, at the University of Washington. Um, our current uh, principal investigator is Dr. Tom Burbacker, who is a professor in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences at UW as well. Um, Terrace is also supported by our wonderful program administrator, uh, Jenny Yang. And uh, the risk ratings in Terrace are specifically vetted by an advisory board uh, of eight world experts in clinical teratology. Uh, we meet twice a year, either in person um, at our annual meeting um, of the Society of Birth Defects and Prevention, or over video conferencing, which has been the case uh, lately. Um, and uh, we review all the updated summaries and engage in discussions and get a group consensus from the um, uh, from the group from the, from the board on the risk ratings. So I'd like to mention who was on our board because it's uh, it's a feature that we are very lucky uh, to have on Terrace and, and distinguishes Terrace from other resources. On our board, we have Dr. Jan Friedman, who is the founder of Terrace. I mentioned him earlier. We have Dr. Ken Jones, who is the world-renowned dysmorphologist and teratologist. He's considered the leading expert of fetal alcohol syndrome, as he was one of the two doctors at um, UW who first identified uh, fetal alcohol syndrome in the United States yeah. in 1973. So we are also fortunate to have Dr. Um, Rich Miller. He's a senior pharmacologist and uh, toxicologist and teratology expert from the University of uh, Rochester Medical Center and Dr. Margaret Adams, our clinical geneticist from UW. Also on our board, we have four senior perinatal epidemiologists, uh, Dr. Christina Chambers from UCSD, Dr. Sonia Hernandez-Diaz from Harvard uh, School of Public Health, Dr. Cheryl Broussard from the Division of um, uh, Birth Defects and Infant Disorders at CDC, and Dr. Gary Shaw from um, Stanford University. So it really takes a team to be able to review all the literature, all the studies, and come up with these very easy, short summaries. What are some of the information that healthcare providers can access in the summaries? And we're going to include an example on the website, but just for a preview for people, what, what information is included in the breakdown? 
clinical assessment of human teratogenic risk requires careful interpretation of data obtained from several kinds of human studies as well as animal studies. So in Teras, analysis of each agent's teratogenicity has been made on the basis of um, its reproducibility, consistency, and biological plausibility of available data or uh, of available clinical, epidemiological, um, and experimental data. And the reproducibility is uh, considered to be particularly important if this if the study if the studies are of um, different design, and if the types of uh, anomalies observed in various studies are consistent. So, um, um, near the beginning, if you want to know what what information is available in Terrace, so near the beginning of each agent summary would be an um, what we call an aphorism. Uh, printed clearly or entirely in capital letters, and it rates the risks and the quality of data available upon which the risk rating has been determined. This aphorism with rates the risk of teratogenic effects in the children of women exposed to the agent during pregnancy as either none, minimal, small, moderate, high, undetermined, or unlikely. In some instances, this um, rating is amplified by a comment. For example, an agent may be rated as undetermined with a comment that says a small risk cannot be excluded, but there is no indication that the risk of congenital anomalies in the children of women treated with this agent during pregnancy is likely to be great. And similarly, the risk of teratogenic effects may be, may be rated as unlikely um, with a comment that says unlikely to pose a substantial teratogenic risk with usual exposures, just to make it clearer. Uh, what it means. Um, so, to conclude, um, uh, so you so so you wouldn't conclude that there is absolutely no risk. Um, so, um, and and such statements are made uh, specifically on the basis of general pharmacology, animal data, or or analogy to closely related agents that have been more thoroughly studied. Then. Um, um, the aphorism also rates the available data. So, which um, right below the risk rating, there is a quality of data. And those are uh, based as none, limited, fair, good, or excellent. And risk assessments based on the evidence that is limited or fair ought to be considered tentative uh, and may change as more information would be available for that agent. Um, and so um, preceding all of this is a brief discussion of the data upon which it is based. Uh, so emphasis has been placed primarily on information obtained from human studies. And experimental animal studies are also included to amplify and clarify the analysis. But in general, only experiments in mammals are considered. Um, and the references we have at the end included uh, in the agent summaries have been selected for their quality and accessibility. Um, these references are not intended to provide a comprehensive bibliography, but rather to help the clinician obtain a broader understanding of the agent's effects on the embryo and the fetus. So we provide free summaries as well. If you go to our website, we provide free summaries, um, uh, a sample summaries, and the COVID-related summaries are all available uh, for free all the time because of the, its need. So we have COVID agents, we have the, the medication, the vaccines associated, um, and that are updated on a regular basis of every three months. And how can people subscribe and access the information that's not included in that free? You know, it's, it's fantastic you're offering the COVID resources that are free because that's so important right now for all healthcare providers to know. Um, if they're looking to access some of the other drug summaries, I mean, you have over 1,700, so all of those, um, how can they subscribe to Terrace? Um, so when you visit our website at... Um deohs.washington.edu slash Terrace. It's a long website because it's affiliated with the university, but you can simply Google Terrace University of Washington and you'll get there. Um, so subscriptions there, um, you go to subscribe now and you'll find that we have a list of licenses that you could choose from. Um, subscriptions, uh, there are subs for individual use. Um, and you can also, there's, li there's a license for clinical use that involves two to four practitioners. There is also another uh, license for, um, um, uh, you know, for 10 investigators or more to use uh, Terrace under one license. Um, and there are also large volume licensing, such as for pharmaceutical companies, uh, medical centers or universities, um, which are also available. We uh, uh, provide uh, an evaluation license for, um, for um, um, uh, 15 days, which is for free. 
to members of the National Society of Genetic Counselors and would like to extend that as well to uh, DNA uh, Today uh, subscribers or listeners. So, uh, so um, another thing we provide is an academic license that is also at, at no charge provided to medical students and uh, medical residents until the end of their program. So all of these press subscriptions are managed by the Comotion Innovation Center at the University of Washington. Uh, while there are several sources of information available on the safety of drug exposures uh, during pregnancy, Terrace is unique in that it is governed by an advisory board of global authorities in clinical teratology from the fields of medicine, epidemiology, and genetics. And the advisory board carefully reviews all agent summaries and teratogenic risk ratings are generated by group consensus. This makes the level of clinical authority on the teratogenic risks provided by Terrace unmatched in the world. Also, unlike other teratogenic risk databases, Terrace is an academic resource located at the School of Public Health at the University of Washington, which is ranked fourth in the world. The Terrace database is considered an intellectual property of the University of Washington. Well, thank you so much for just sharing all this expertise on the show. There's so much to learn. And again, check out the website in the show notes and the podcast, dnapodcast.com is where you can access that. And you can connect with us on social media. Search DNA Today on all the social media places. Any questions for myself or Dr. Alwyn can be sent into info at dnapodcast.com. Thanks for listening and watching. You can join us next time to learn, discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA.